hello everybody. It's wonderful to see you or to see you as in the letter C and the letter U. Looking forward to an in-person things at some point soon. Um, I just want to give uh, Max Bashman a little bit of an introduction. You've already read a decent amount of what he has done, which is quite something. I want to add to that a little bit. Max, a business school professor, is also an important figure in the national discussion on business ethics and in negotiation. He's written books, and we're talking about one in particular today, so I, he'll tell you more about that, but about managerial decision making and about experiments and also about the power of noticing. And I'm going to say that I first heard Max speak at the Mount Auburn uh, Thursday morning talks, and he was talking about the power of noticing. And I'm not kid kidding, noticing. It was ex an extraordinary discussion about something that we all do or don't take for granted and very um, indicative of uh, Max's sort of intriguing, educated and eternally curious mind. His thinking as you'll see today and in this book um, combines social science, combines research, philosophy, as well as um, personal investigation. Uh, so I wanna just introduce Max Bazerman. He is a man I learn a lot from. He's a Cambridge resident, a serial dog owner, a vegetarian, and in the most profound sense <clears throat> word, a mensch. So I hand you over to, to Max Bazerman. Thank you so much, Kristen. Um, and Kristen, thank you for uh, making this happen and for inviting me. And thanks to all of you for spending um, your uh, early dinner time with me. So um, by all means, by the way, feel free to eat. So if you have food in front of you, don't, don't be shy. Um, drinking wine is completely acceptable as well. Um, so make yourself at home. Um, the other thing uh, I'll say is that um, I, I like interruptions, even, even if it takes the form of heckling. So, um, <laughs> so if um, I say something disturbing or disagreeable, or you just want to kind of join into the discussion, we don't have to wait for the discussion period. Um, I'll figure out how to get through enough of the talk, um, regardless of what happens along the way. Um, so um, Kristen mentioned that my most recent book is a book called Better Not Perfect, um, a realistic, a realist, a realist guide to maximum sustainable development. Um, this is kind of, um, um, I, I've written about a dozen books, and this is the book that I view as um, the most personal. This is kind of um, trying to write down how I think about how to lead a kind of a better life. And, and I'm sure that my formula won't be the, one, the same as your formula, um, but I hope that I can at least bring up some ideas that you might find um, a little bit intriguing. Um, so if, if things are going well, you see a copy of my book, Better Not Perfect. And as I click, you see a, a slide that says decision-making at the top. Are, are we all set? Next. Yeah, yep, excellent. Thank you, Laura. Um, so um, by background, um, most of my work is in the world of decision-making and negotiation. So I'm a professor at the Harvard Business School in a group called Negotiations uh, negotiations, organizations, and markets. Um, some of you might have known um, Professor Howard Rafa when he was alive. Um, he was certainly one of the founders of the ideas that created the unit and, and certainly one of my intellectual heroes. Um, and um, within business schools, if you um, sort of run into people who teach decision-making or negotiation, one core concept that, um, that comes up over and over again is a notion of rationality, um, where rationality refers to maximizing whatever it is that you want to maximize. So you might want to make money, you might want to maximize your happiness, you might want to create the most good, um, whatever it is that you want to maximize, that's kind of what we talk about, that, that's sort of a goal state that we um, accept. But there's lots of research that shows that we're incapable of ever getting there. And that we have a variety of systematic biases that keep us from being as rational as we want. And some of you may know the work of uh, Daniel Kahneman's book, Thinking Fast and Slow, or a phenomena that broadly now goes by the term of behavioral economics um, that talks about what these bounds are. And we also try to develop strategies that help our students and people more generally to make more rational decisions, even though we generally believe we can't get there. In, um, in my um, new book, Better Not Perfect, um, 
it's, I, I focus more on moral decision making. Um, and by moral decision making, I mean making decisions to maximize cumulative welfare of all sentient beings. So this is many of you um, who took philosophy at some point um, ran into the concept of utilitarianism, which is a truly terrible term. Um, but uh, obviously the early utilitarians didn't have a good marketing department. Um, but utilitarians believe that uh, the most moral decision is the decision that creates the most cumulative good, okay? But most of us, despite the fact that that sounds pretty good, aren't necessarily all that effective at making all of our decisions to create the most good possible because of biases, because of selfishness, because of tribalism, um, where we favor our own group, whether that's um, our family, our re religion, our community over other groups. So we claim a belief in equality, yet we privilege some groups over other groups, and that keeps us from doing as much good as possible. Um, my focus is on prescription or on how we're going to move people, move ourselves, in my case, move myself, so that I can create more good than I would had I not thought about it in more careful, deliberative form. So my goal for 2021 um, is pretty simple. I want to create more good in the world than I created in 2020. And if all goes well, um, my goal for 2022 will be to create more good in 2022 than I did in 2021. So um, I want to create more good. And rather than having an unrealistic standard of making all my decisions perfectly, my goal is to be better, even if I can't be perfect. Now, all of that sounds pretty straightforward. Um, and here's a more kind of formal view of what utilitarianism looks like. It means to maximize aggregate pleasure and minimize aggregate pain across all sentient beings. It means being efficient in the pursuit of the good that we can create. So Kristen in our breakout group um, talked about measurement. Well, we probably do need to measure if we're going to figure out, are we creating the most good we can? It means making our decisions independent of the preferences based on our own wealth or status in society. So what would be the fair decision independent of who we were? And it means valuing the equality of interests of all equally, which a lot of us endorse, but I would argue very few of us are capable of actually reaching. So those are some of the concepts that we're gonna be exploring over the next half hour. And again, you're welcome to jump in anytime. But to get us started, um, I wanna show you um, my adaptation of perhaps the most famous philosophy problem that exists. And a few of you are going to recognize this, but I'll ask you to pay careful attention um, because my version is a little bit different than what you may have seen elsewhere. And um, this problem exists in trolley land. Um, and just to be clear, because we probably have some lawyers out there, um, none of the laws you know are relevant in trolley land. Um, we're, we're looking at what's moral, not what's legal here. And the problem you have, and by the way, just to orient you, you're that person with a question mark over your head. And um, by the way, for those of you who have who watched a comedy, The Good Place, you may have seen the, a version of this problem while you were watching TV as well. But the problem you have is that train that's coming down the track. If you do nothing, unfortunately, it's going to go to the left. It's going to hit those three people who, were, who will die an instant and painless death. Fortunately, you have the opportunity to save them and you can do that by turning the switch. But if you turn the switch, the train will go to the right-hand side of the track. You'll save the three, but that innocent person on the right-hand side of the track will get hit by the trolley and die an instant and painless death, okay? And Rather than asking you what you would do, because we don't want to put you on the spot in case you might not want to answer, um, I'll tell you that I've given this problem to dozens of classes, and the majority, not all, but the majority of this group would switch 
uh, so that we only had one person perish rather than three. And this is consistent with utilitarianism because we're aggregating the most pleasure and minimizing the most pain. So people act, the majority of people act, not all, um, based on some notion of doing the most good that we possibly can. Others have a justice perspective and think that we don't have the right to turn the switch, given that the person on the right hasn't authorized it. But I already mentioned we're in trolley land um, and um, it will be an instant and painless death. All right, so what I wanna tell you is utilitarians switch. Now this problem is a little bit more complicated. Um, to begin with, you'll notice that there are five people on the track rather than three. And, uh, and if you do nothing, that train is going to kill them and they are gonna die in an instant and painless death. This time you can recognize yourself because you still have the question mark over your head. If you turn the switch, that guy on top of the bridge will fall from the bridge through the, oh, the, the floor that opens up in the middle. Um, he will get hit by a trolley, die an instant and painless death, and become a trolley stopper, saving the five people on the track. And the question is, do you drop him or not? Okay. Now, despite the fact that a minute ago, I told you that the majority of people tend to switch to save three, even if it costs one, I'll now tell you that um, when given this problem, most people say, no, I don't have the right to drop the guy from the bridge. Even though I could get a five for one deal, um, this is morally unacceptable. Okay, and when you ask why, they often tell you things like, I don't have the right to use the person as a trolley stopper. All right, so that's his background. And so what I'm reporting to you so far is people do switch to get a three for one deal, they don't drop to get a five for one deal, okay? And here's a third version of the problem. You'll recognize yourself in the middle. You're still in trolley land, no legal implications. And there's two trains coming down two different tracks. On the left, three will perish. On the right, five will perish. You can turn switch A or you, or you can turn switch B. You can't turn both switches, they both won't operate. So it's one or the other or neither. And the question is, would you switch to get save three for one on the left, drop on the right to get save five for one or do nothing? And the interesting part of this result is that in this strange problem, despite the fact that I earlier told you that switching in A was more popular than switching in B, when you have both of the problems simultaneously, people turn the switch on B, dropping the guy to save five. So if A was just more popular than B, why is B now popular than A? And the answer is that when we are looking at two or more problems at the same time, we tend to deliberate, we tend to be more cognitive, we tend to be less emotional, we tend to make more rational decisions, and from a utilitarian perspective, we tend to make more and more decisions as well. In other research, where we have people work on a hiring problem in a context where they're hiring somebody for a math-related problem, for a math-related job, where you can all imagine that there's discrimination against women, okay, what we find is that when we move people from evaluating one employee at a time to comparing two or more employees at the same time, discrimination against women for math-related tasks virtually disappears. We tend to see biases like racism, like sexism, when we're evaluating one person at a time. When we compare two or more people, we tend to quit using our biases and we tend to use job-related criteria to make better decisions, but also more moral decisions at the same time. Okay, now I wanna to return to this problem, version of the problem. And um, I wanna uh, mention to you, so this is Cambridge, 
So I'll, I'll mention to you um, another philosopher um, by the name of John Rawls. And John Rawls was lived in Cambridge. He was a Harvard professor, probably the most famous philosopher of the second half of the 20th century. And John Rawls was famous for a concept called the veil of ignorance. And the way the veil of ignorance works is if you wanted to think about what would be a fair society, what you need to try to do is to think about what would you think was fair if you didn't know whether you were rich or poor, you didn't know whether you were white or black, you didn't know if you were male or female, you didn't know if you lived in Cambridge or Nairobi or Oakland, California. If you didn't know who you were, what would be a fair decision? And Rawls thought that if we wanna get people to think about what would truly be fair, what we need to do is get them out of the mindsets that come from the position that they hold in society. It's, a, I think, a quite intriguing notion. So I want to now use veil of ignorance on my sort of bizarre problem. And before you decide what to do, I want you to imagine that you're one of the six people who could be affected by the decision. You could be the person on the bridge, or you could be one of the five people on the track. Now there's six people. So there's a five, six chance you're one of the people on the track and a one, six chance you're the person on the bridge. Before I ask you the moral question, what I want you to do is think about what do you want the question mark guy to do? Do you want him to drop the guy from the bridge or not? And most people say, sure, I'd rather have a five, six chance of living than a one, six chance of living. And after thinking through Rawls's veil of ignorance, when we ask people what is a moral thing to do, they now say dropping the guy from the bridge is the moral thing to do. Having thought through the implications for all the people involved, okay, we now tend to see morality closer to doing the most aggregate good. Now, some of you are tired of my trolley problems, which I completely understand. So I thought I'd move you into the, a COVID problem. Um, some of you are sick of COVID too, which I completely understand. Um, and um, <clears throat> if I had the data, I'd be showing you a vaccine version, but this is, we, we collected this data a year ago. So we're gonna be talking about ventilators. So here's the problem. Should a hospital's only remaining ventilator be given to a 65-year-old patient who arrived at the hospital first, who would get it under the rule first come, first serve, or a 25-year-old patient who arrives moments later, who would get the ventilator under the utilitarian strategy of saving the most life, year, life years possible? And I want you to assume that the patient who gets the ventilator lives and the one who doesn't, unfortunately, does not live. And I want you to think about what you think you might want to do in this particular context. And um, we asked a bunch of people. And what we saw was something called, that we described, the psychologists would call self-serving biases. The young people we asked, those between 18 and 30, the significant majority say, give it to the young person. But the people who were over 60 who we asked, said, no, give it to the 65-year-old, okay? So people were biased in favor of their own, okay? And you could think of this, this is based on age, but there are lots of self-serving biases that we could demonstrate based on race, religion, community, nationality, et cetera, all right? But then we decided to bring John Rawls to bear on this problem. And we asked people, first think about if there was a 20, if, it, if there was a 50% chance you were either the old person or the young person, what would you think would be the best decision, not the more moral decision? And people now say you should save as many life years as you can. And then when we ask them the same question as before, we ask them who should get the remaining ventilator. Now the majority of all three groups are now giving it to the young person to save the most life years possible. So the veil of ignorance takes away 
the self-serving biases <coughs> that we bring to lots of different problems. So it's a cognitive exercise that's moderately easy to induce that affects how people make decisions. So if you want to make better decisions in life that also happen to be more moral decisions, where I'm, I've already defined morality as making the decision that will create the most amount of good across all sentient beings. One key point is that deliberation works better than intuition. All of us love our intuition. And your intuition may be far better than most people's. But I don't want you to compare your intuition to other people's intuition. I want you to compare your intuition to the quality of your decision if you think more deliberatively. And what I want to suggest is that more deliberative thought leads to better decisions than more intuitive thought. So in philanthropy, let me give you two scenarios. Throughout the year, you are asked by a variety of people whether you will donate to Charity X, and you make a decision, yes or no. But imagine, and this is going to be true for many of you, once a year, perhaps December, you sit down with your partner and you decide where you're going to make a set of charitable decisions. Well, all I want you to do is think about which of these two procedures, this one at a time or this comparative deliberation leads to donating where your dollars are gonna do the most good. It's my prediction that your deliberative comparative processes lead you to engage in thought of creating the most good possible. So we've talked about two strategies, comparative outperforms one at a time, and putting on a veil of ignorance allows you to take away the biases that you bring based on who you are in society. But I think you can also develop a notion about creating the most value as a way of leading your life. So this is a chart. Those of you who took economics a long time ago ran into this kind of frontier. You may recall the name Pareto efficient frontier. But for simplicity, I want you to imagine that you currently live at point A, where you create value to others, but you also create value to you. What I, th what I want to argue is that if we can make decisions that allow us to create more good, our own life can improve, but we can also create more good for other people. So rather than seeing this as a trade-off, between value to you and value to others, how can we create more value for others in a way that allows us to lead our own life more effectively? So I think about value creation as a strategy. And finally, um, I wanna suggest to you that most of us are really good people in some domains, but maybe not quite as good in other domains, okay? And, um, this is a very famous cartoon from over 100 years ago. And those two people on the pedestal, that's the same person, that's Andrew Carnegie, who was very famous as a good guy philanthropist. You can see him donating buildings and money on the right-hand side. And on the left-hand side, some of you may recall the Homestead Strike, where he was a ruthless capitalist who was truly evil to the workers um, of essentially U.S. steel, okay? And there's lots of evidence that he was at least complicit in the murder of more than a dozen employees during this famous strike. So you had the same person who both created value but destroyed value. I would argue that Andrew Carnegie had more power to create good if he focused more on the value that he was destroying on the left rather than simply focusing on doing good on the right. I would argue that the modern day Andrew Carnegie would be the Sackler family, who we see their name on lots of different buildings. On the other hand, they've destroyed hundreds of thousands of lives by mismarketing. I'm not saying marketing, I'm saying mismarketing the product that they produced 
fueling the opioid epidemic. But I think we all can think about in our lives, where do we create good, but where do we miss opportunities? And most of us tend to focus on where we get the best record, and perhaps we can create the most value if we think about where we may miss opportunities. So what can we do? Um, or where can we create this good? I think one answer is by noticing and speaking out against evil. So when um, I think about the last presidency, um, I think Trump is an evil human being who destroyed massive amounts of value in the world, okay? Um, I'm happy to argue over that over, sort of in the discussion or at any time you like. Um, and we focus on Trump, but I think we also need to think about his enablers, the people who were complicit in allowing him to do evil, the people who didn't necessarily agree with his white supremacy and his destruction of democracy, but were willing to put up with it because they were getting other things that they wanted. I'm thinking about people like Mitch McConnell. The Nazis obviously had their collaborators, which we've read about in history, um, and they couldn't have created the harm without that. But we also can think about, um, if we think about the Sacklers, we can think about the, the distribution companies that distributed opioids at levels that didn't make any sense and they knew what they were doing and they were allowing the Sacklers to get their opioid products out. We could think about Elizabeth Holmes at Theranos who mismarketed her drug, her blood treatment products. And we had a board of directors of very famous people who were negligent and not noticing that the data just uh, didn't make sense. So I think that there's a lot we can do by simply noticing and speaking out when evil's around us. Um, we could reduce waste. And this goes from the trivial. Um, so I've always been bothered by the fact that some people view a doggy bag, doggy bag in a restaurant. You'll remember restaurants. Those are the places we used to go eat before COVID. But some people like demonize doggy bags, um, those bags where you take home leftovers. And I think doggy bags are just great for society. Okay, why have that food wasted? Okay, the world is simply better if it's consumed by you or by the a homeless person you happen to walk by, but having it simply rot is a waste. Now, I bring up a trivial example because I think we can see waste at all kinds of levels, okay? Um, I need to tell you that, I, that we frequently get packages by Amazon, and there's a lot of things that I think Amazon does well, um, but there's things that they just do wrong, and I, I mean morally wrong. And I would include their search for their second headquarters. So some of you may have followed this episode a couple of years ago where they had an open competition for which state and, and township would create the largest subsidy to lure them to bring the, the, their second headquarters to their municipality. And communities spent millions of dollars a piece to create proposals to attract Amazon's H2 headquarters because it would create tens of thousands of jobs, okay? So you can imagine that this is a worthwhile investment. The problem was that Amazon lured 218 different communities to bid, okay? And it's pretty clear that no more than a half a dozen had any chance of actually winning. So over 200 communities spent millions of dollars, hundreds of hundreds to thousands of hours, resources that could have been used to improve the schools and the health of the community when they had absolutely no chance. And I would argue Amazon got nothing out of it. I would call that waste. Um, using your time wisely, Eric Grunbaum in our discussion was talking about how he uses his time. And we all have different passions for how our time can be most used most effectively. Um, I'll tell you as a professor, I get lots of requests for my time. And a lot of us sort of affectively decide to say yes or no 
on a one-shot basis. I think that it's useful to ask yourself, how can my time be most effectively used? How can I create the most good possible with my charitable time, rather than simply saying, do I feel like saying yes or no in this particular instance? I think we can have more um, of an impact. Um, I'm 65 as I speak to you uh, today. Um, for my 50th birthday party, um, for not party, for my 50th birthday, my present to myself was I audited my life to think about where am I spending time that I don't enjoy, where I'm not creating as much value as I could. And I identified a variety of activities that it was time to stop or at least reduce significantly. Um, and at the risk uh, to avoid offending anybody, I'll avoid telling you what activities I quit. Um, and finally, donating more effectively. Um, so again, our group talked a, a fair amount about impact investing to go along with philanthropy um, when we were talking between 5.30 and 6. Um, but I, I, and, and, and I certainly want to put that into this pile. Um, but there's a whole world developing um, that goes under the term effective altruism. And effective altruists tend to be applied utilitarians who think about their, their, their philanthropy in terms of creating the most good you possibly can do. One of the things that they want to convince people to do is to donate more, because most people who are well off can donate more than they currently do without any lingering suffering at all. Okay. But they also focus on where will your dollars create the most good? Okay, this doesn't just mean reducing overhead. So there's an organization called the Charity Navigator that will direct you to how to minimize the percent of your dollars that go to, to overhead in philanthropy. But the effective altruism community it would basically say that that's too narrow. We don't want to focus on how do we affect the percent of dollars that are spent beyond overhead. We want to think about how do we save the most lives? How do we feed the most kids? How do we bring health to the most number within the context of equality so that all lives are created equal, okay? Which again is something we tend to not do, particularly when we're overly biased by a narrow definition of the nature of the group of people that we're most concerned with. And we could talk a long time about um, donating more effectively, and I'm happy to do that if that's where the discussion goes. But the basic concept is to be more deliberative and not just think about what donation will make you feel good, but how do you have the biggest impact that you possibly can with the dollars that you're choosing to contribute. Okay, so um, I'm going to simply close by uh, by highlighting that um, the goal of my talk, the goal of, of my most recent book, is to help move myself, but maybe you, um, toward my maximal sustainable goodness. So I can't be perfect. I'm not going to donate 95% of my wealth this year because there's people who are very poor who could use the money. I'm, I'm not that good of a person, but I can do better than I did last year. So I, so. Marla and I are going to donate significantly more in 2021 than we did in 2020. Um, I try to be more deliberative about my decisions and my actions so that I can create more good. In sum, the goal is to figure out how we can all be better through better decisions, even if we can't be fully rational or fully utilitarian or moral. We can all lead better lives. So with that, I think I'll stop here and hopefully I've given enough thought um, to, to create some arguments or discussion. Um, and I'd love to hear from all of you. So, so Max, this is Kristen. I have a question. I know you, Kristen. Good to see you again. <laughs> Good to see you. Um, I, I'm a little puzzled, a little stuck with the concept of value creation. Yeah. To be very straightforward, I am not Andrew Carnegie. I don't mm -hmm. have that kind no. of 
I can't do whole buildings and I can't, but at the same time, instinctively, what you're talking about seems good, but I, I, it's, I, it's, I'm having trouble with some of the specific possibilities and maybe other people have other ideas. Um, sure, so, so, so I'm arguing that when you deliberate rather than make your decisions intuitively, and you give to organizations that create more impact per dollar, you're creating value, okay? So if your um, $1,000 can feed um, 100 kids rather than 30 kids, okay? You're creating value by moving from an ineffective philanthropy to a very effective philanthropy. When you use your time where it can have the most power, you're creating value, okay? So when, whenever we're more efficient with our time, our money, and our leadership, we're creating value. Catherine, please. I was just gonna say, can you please take us off screen share? Oh, sure. Yeah, thank you so much. No, thank you. That was easy. I like easy questions, Catherine. Well <laughs> Wait, wait. I'm, <laughs> um, I'm not done yet because when you say when you feed more people, but some of the organizations I've been involved in looking at um, provide social services. So it's not, they've got eight ounces of meat and six ounces of vegetable or whatever. It's not yeah. easily measurable. And there is always the, the general question of um, more to many or, or deeper to few. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I, I, I'm thinking, well, I, what, what, you, what I hear you saying is look at more than one organization, which I thought was fascinating. When you are looking at different yeah. things that you get more rational by comparison. But um, I, I, I'm still, well, I'll let, I love that other people ask questions. Yeah. So, and, and I haven't answered your question to, to a bit to many or to more to a few, but I would say um, if you're going to go for, um, making more kids healthy, educating more kids, what, for, what form of philanthropy is going to achieve those oh, goals okay. most effectively? Okay. Okay. Um, okay. So you do some of your philanthropy in Africa and there are an awful lot of interventions in Africa that have proven to be quite ineffective. Yep. And there are other interventions that have prove to be enormously effective. So it means paying attention to the evidence on what works rather than paying attention to, did you like the appeal of the person who just asked you for those funds? Mm -hmm. um, so I, so we, can be a, we can be more effective in our decisions in lots and lots of different ways, I think. Interesting. That's very interesting. Shippen has a question, Shippen? Yeah, thanks very much, Max. Fascinating conversation. I was brought back to a friend of mine. I used to run a group called Revels, which produces uh, seasonal celebrations. And um, I asked him for a, gener for a generous donation. He said, what are the metrics? And rather in a cheeky way, I said, how about love? How does that work for you? <laughs> and he was sort of saying, what are you talking about? But I think what my question is, when the appeal goes to the heart rather than the head, it's a spiritual dimension. How do you navigate that space? Um, so first of all, I think love is a fine thing. Um, I think happiness is really good. So if, if we go back a lot to the beginning, I said maximize pleasure and minimize pain. I didn't say get as many dollars as you can. So uh, maximizing pleasure and minimizing pain, those sound like closer to love um, in terms of what we're trying to accomplish. And measurement is hard. But I would say just because it's hard doesn't mean that we shouldn't do it. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Okay. And, and the more we think about organizations comparatively, particularly comparatively in the same domain, many of us know that some organizations are more effective than others if we stop to think about it. In other cases, there are good resources on what kind of interventions are actually working. And I think that too many of us, and I'll plead guilty to myself, have spent too many years making decisions intuitively with fairly little information based on our mood or based on the person making the appeal rather than trying our best to, 
create as much love as possible. So if love is what you're trying to maximize, all I want you to do is do it well. And the fact that you can't give me a good formula doesn't mean that you can't comparatively think about which, uh, which of multiple organizations is going to create more of it, okay? Now, I'll, I'll also tell you that, um, so some of you have been to my home. So I'm married to Marla Felcher and Marla's pretty, um, pretty um, good at putting 80 people in our living room and convincing um, people to contribute to, to her favorite cause. Um, and some of you have been there to, to see that and she's very good. And um, when I talk to Marla about some of my favorite causes that I think are effective, she'll, she'll bluntly tell me, Max, my crowd isn't going to donate to them. <laughs> okay, so, so assume for a minute that my, that my favorite cause is more effective in some abstract way of measuring this love and happiness, et cetera. But Marla is right. What happens if her crowd is only going to donate to an organization where they can meet the ED, they can shake hands, they can see the people who are recipients? My reaction is, great, maximize subject to whatever constraints people want to put on the problem, okay? Um, because getting, um, um, getting resources to educate the kids in Boston is just great. And, it, and the fact that um, you could educate more kids in Tanzania for the same dollars doesn't matter if, if the target isn't going to pay attention to your message. And that's why I'm arguing we want to be better, not perfect. We all have our limitations on why we aren't going to actually donate 95% of our wealth to where we would actually maximize pleasure and minimize pain. So add whatever barriers you want on, but now can we identify ways that would allow us to do more good with less pain? So um, um, ma many, many years ago, um, Marla was in a conversation with uh, Billy Shore. Many of you might know Billy Shore, um, the, the founder and the head of uh, Share Our Strength. And Billy was my freshman roommate. Um, and this was a dozen years ago. And the topic of dinner, dinner conversation was how do you manage in an environment where um, there's people who have had their jobs forever but aren't doing a good job? Do you, make, do you make change happen or not? And I remember Billy saying, you need to remember why the organization exists. So in my, my case, the reason is to feed hungry kids, okay? And if your goal is to feed hungry kids, you need to make your management decisions so that you're able to do the best job you possibly can at that. And sort of uh, the, the social aspect of one or two employees shouldn't get in the way of creating what your organization is funded to do. And I think that that's very consistent with this notion of how do you maximize pleasure, minimize pain and move or our organizations in that direction. Shippen, am I, am I addressing your question? Absolutely, Max. I mean, I think this is a qualitative discussion and I think one's passion sometimes merges with one's head and sometimes mm -hmm. it doesn't, but the idea of maximizing whatever your particular variable is is an incredibly important um, criteria. So thank right. you for that. I, I, I appreciate the complexity of it. And I appreciate your, your thoughts. Yeah, thank you. I wanted to, Paula, I wanted, to, you had a question and would you uh, please talk a little bit about the Mood Award? Uh, and could I quickly mention that I'm busy listening to you so I haven't been reading chat. So um, if you put something in chat and you're annoyed that I haven't responded, you're gonna have to yell out after Paula. Okay, um, well, I'm, I'm, now I'm trying to figure out which order I should do this thing, but let me ask a question because you talk about impact and impact is a thing. I, um, I, I'm a COO of a, of a nonprofit organization. So I see things from, um, from, from both sides, uh, both sides of philanthropy, but, but impact is something that's been around for the last 10 years. Uh, by the way, I'm happy to hear I'm a big fan of the Cathedral Within. So 
Uh, that's that's one of Billy Shore's books. Yeah, no, I yeah. know. I've actually worked with an, another or a previous organization that was Billy Shore. I'm I'm a big fan of Billy Shore. Um, but impact, uh, I would like to hear what uh, your explanation of what impact is. And I think in the chat, I said, is it always getting the biggest bang for the buck? Is it always measured in units? When people, I get nervous when people talk about impact and metrics. Uh, and if, if I can be so mm -hmm. bold as to say, they don't always know what they're talking about. Excellent, thank you. So, um, so. And then I have a point up to yeah. you to answer question. So I'll try to answer, and then you can, and then you can uh, elaborate, um, and then make your point, and and uh, um, and and move us forward. So, um, so uh, Paula, I, I think that if we had the long discussion, we're on the same page, okay? Because I, I I think that you actually don't like people saying, "If I can't measure it, I don't care," which I would never make that statement. So um, I, I think I just talked to Shippen for a moderate amount of time about saying love is a fine outcome. And the fact that we can't measure precisely doesn't mean that we don't care. So my reaction is we still wanna think hard about are we creating the most good we can even on hard to measure aspects, okay? So um, I, think we get, I think we know a lot about how many lives malaria nets can save in various African countries. And I think that that's actually good to know that. And I think that we can compare that to other interventions to save the most number of lives. But we not only want kids in Boston to be fed, we want them to thrive. We want them to be happy. Um, and we don't want the measurement to simply be, do they go to an Ivy League college? That doesn't seem to capture happiness all that well. So I think we're back to where I was with Shippen, where I'm saying we want to maximize whatever makes people happy and minimizes their suffering. The fact that it's hard to measure doesn't mean that we don't care about it, but we can at least try to structure our thoughts so that we're more likely to be doing more good rather than accepting the current level of good. So, so Paula, I would change, I would change it to saying, you know, if the question is, Max, are you saying XYZ organization is not good enough? I don't think of it that way. I would say, could I, could I imagine thinking about XYZ organization with a bunch of other smart people who are on this Zoom in ways that would allow them to do more good with the same dollars? Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, all of a sudden now people say, I think I could work on that problem. Okay, well, that, that, that's, that's what I was saying earlier. I just want to maximize pleasure, minimize pain. And the fact that we can't measure it all precisely doesn't mean that we shouldn't be striving to create more good. So I'm not sure if I'm responding to your question or not. Um, yeah, you are. I just wanted to hear you. You mentioned impact. And so I wanted to, to challenge you to define what you mean by impact because it's yeah. a word that gets... That, that gets used a lot without um, what, yeah. as, so, with the assumption that everybody knows what it means. Yeah, so, uh, um, so, so I don't want to take on other people's use of impact investing as my own without being told how they're using it. So um, I, I'm going to go back to kind of Peter Singer utilitarian philosophy, which I presented to you earlier, and say, yeah. maximize pleasure, minimize pain. That's what I mean about a, a good use of the notion of impact. Yes. So yes. So thank you. And and again, not simple. It is complex. But um, I just I, I I wanted to get I wanted to get that clarification. And so I want to transition into I think as I was reading as I was quickly reading um, your book, um, I did think about the notion about creating value. And so I want to speak on, I am the, we, uh, at the Cambridge Club uh, for uh, a number of years. Um, someone can tell me if they know what the number is. Um, have a scholarship or it's an award. And in, we award um, high school students. Uh, it's a financial um, award for their 
community service and their service particularly to the community, uh, the larger Cambridge community, sometimes within the school, sometimes out, outside of the school. And we do this, it is a, it, it is a fundraiser uh, uh, because it is financed by contributions, uh, donations made by, the, made by the members. So I want to take this opportunity to um, think about this, ask people to think about this in terms of the value that's created, uh, to thank those people who have contributed uh, the, to the 2021 award, and to also tell you that it's not too late to uh, donate for this year. We, you, those of you who were at um, two meetings ago, we had some alumni. And so in terms of a return on an investment, you got to see uh, some uh, amazing young people five, six years out and what they have done in their community service lives just to extend and expand it. So um, we're planting the seeds for future, uh, future community service, service to this community or the communities where they end up. So that's it for me. Um, thank okay. you. Thank you, Paula. And if you want to make donations, send them to Minka, our treasurer, and um, I'll send you, I'll be sending you an email in the next few days and I'll send more information about that. Um, Kristen, did you want to? For those, just, just one second, for those that are um, interested in the numbers, we've raised about half of our goal. So our goal is to give each of the two students that have been selected for an award this year, $5,000. So we're at the, about the halfway mark. Wonderfully done. Um, Kathy, I just saw that, uh, I thought that Michelle Holmes had her hand up, so. She did. Michelle? Yes, thank you. Um, Max, I just wanted to say that um, I appreciate much of what you said, uh, particularly the bit about, um, you know, not holding up perfectionism. I really do. Um, just a little bit about myself. I, I was uh, particularly taken by the example about uh, uh, ventilator rationing. I'm a physician and epidemiologist. I'm also a diversity, equity, and inclusion consultant. And I have written about the, precisely that issue and I'll put it in the chat. So my concern is that your thought experiment does not take into account uh, equity and oppression, right? The fact that most people after deliberation decide that uh, young people should be prioritized only tells me that ageism is the last frontier of the isms. And a hundred years ago, you could have done the same experiment with men and women and people would have been universally in agreement that women should be sacrificed for men or that uh, black people should be sacrificed for white people. So I would just um, uh, encourage you and to, to think about that and include that, uh, the, the fact that, you know, isms are, are held throughout society um, and that the majority rule doesn't mean it's necessarily the moral of the right. Uh, um, first of all, thank you, Michelle. <clears throat> so I don't think I argued for majority rule at all in that. In that. Um, so I think that I do wanna give the ventilator to the 25 year old, despite my 65 year old age. Um, on the other hand, I think that there's lots of reason um, um, to give the vaccines older first. And um, so for me, um, I like the concept on age of thinking about where can you create the most impact. And I think that the vaccine story is very different than the ventilator story. So one solution isn't right for all, all, all those contexts. Um, I think that um, if, if we think away from age and we think about race, um, now we have to think about, we, we have to think a whole lot about sort of how different ethnicities are affected by any kind of allocation procedure, particularly when society is creating, created lots of disadvantages in the past. So, uh, you know, I think on the comorbidity side, um, comorbidities seem to work against people in the ventilator story a year ago. Um, and, and you can easily view that as racist, and I think that I would view that as racist. Um, on the other hand, um, we've treated comorbidities as a reason to get the vaccine more quickly um, in the more recent era. 
Well, but I want to add one other thing, because um, you've met, you, you started by highlighting the fact that you've thought a lot about it. Um, and I think that that's really important. Okay, one of the things that I find striking about the recent vaccine set of decisions is the fact that we waited until the vaccines were physically showing up to make decisions about what was going to happen to them when in the fall, we knew that eventually vaccines were going to appear. And that was the time to have a deliberative debate about where the first group of vaccines can do the most good. And that's the time to be thinking about it, not when the vaccines are sitting there. And sort of in our state and many other states, there were an awful lot of decisions where the priority list seemed to get um, affected by what the media paid attention to on a particular day, rather than what the experts told us would create the most amount of good. Um, in terms of the broader comment about, we need to be careful that we aren't exacerbating disparities when we aim for efficiency. I agree with you completely, um, but I would, I would emphasize that one of my early slides, when I talked about utilitarianism, which, under, uh, sort of which underlies everything that I've been talking about, the equality of interest should be cre created equal, should be treated equally. And if we created disadvantages in the past, then I think that we need to think about how we make adjustments in the current set of decisions um, to pay attention to that. So thank you for everything. I, I think you and I might, might end up being in disagreement on the ventilator, um, uh, on who gets that one ventilator, but everything else that you said I thought was, um, I, I completely agreed with. And Michelle, if, if I said anything bothersome, feel free to respond. I put in the chat my article and uh, the, and the, Thank you. the bottom line of the article was that I advocated for lottery. Ah, huh. okay. Interesting. Huh. Okay, um, that's, a, that's, it, that's interesting. So it, uh, certainly lotteries treat people equally. Um, but I think we can make lots of arguments about how, if, if everybody doesn't know that you're supposed to enter, that that could create problems as well. But, but I, I will track down your article and I look forward to reading it, Michelle. I, I know I kept coming to it in time, but I do want to include, I know um, Deborah Walker has put in a question. And Deborah, would you like to, yeah, to say your question to Max? Like, this is, thank you for the, the, the discussion and all the points, but I'm in public health. So I'm always thinking of the biggest good. And I, good. I well, but here I want to say, our conversation, I feel like has been almost more narrow, a little bit like what Michelle is saying. If you really want to do the most good, you got to go upstream and change policies. So I put big policies in there about getting rid of yeah. nuclear weapons, what we did in the state of tobacco. I would say getting rid of all the racist policies we have in this country that relate to a lot of different things. And frankly, putting the money and investing to change those things in the end will change more than just feeding people, et cetera. It's really like your railroad thing. So I wish people thought in a bigger picture. And I think also it'd be great if people thought like this before they decided what career they're gonna do rather than waiting till the end of where they are and deciding how they're going to spend their money. But those are just some thoughts for- Deborah, I, I agree with everything you, you just said. So um, okay. so way up there on the sort of the top of the list for most effective altruists is climate change. Absolutely. Well, and, and eliminating weapons of mass destruction too. Yeah, is, so, is yeah. And yeah, so I, I could take each piece of what you said and, and tell you why I agree with you, but uh, that would take a while. That's well. not the point. I just, yeah. I just, a lot of times to change things, you must change the policies. And people, it's a long term investment. And people, I find this in my field of public health. If you want to change population health, you've got to change those. And right now, we have an opportunity in this country with all the anti racist stuff that we're doing. And that is where our, you know, a lot of our focus and guns. Anyway, thank you. <laughs> thank you. Um, Rick, are you saying goodbye or do you have a question? No, I had a, just a comment. It just seems to me one way to think about what Max has said is it's probably too late for this year, but I think it might be valuable to have a rigorous conversation on the Mood Award 
as to on this most good? Is it, say you have 10,000, is it five people, 2,000, is it two people, 5,000, is it some other, and how are we thinking about it? So I don't know what the MOOC award committee has done, uh, but it, in thinking about what Max is saying, I've thought about over the last couple of years about what is the right amount and how do we determine that and how do we think about it? I, and I can think about it in a little richer way as a result of this uh, conversation but, uh, that we may want to think about for next year. That, that, that's a really interesting remark. Um, I, so I'm gonna wrap this up. Max, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you all for spending your evening with me. Uh, you know, we, we spend, a lot of us spend so much of our time doing good. It's always nice to have that tool sharpened a little and I feel like mine has been certainly. Um, I want to just remind everyone that um, we have uh, our next speaker, which will be our annual meeting, is um, Al Ortiz, who, and it's about the future of the news. He, Mr. Ortiz, is the Vice President of Standards and longtime executive producer of special events at CBS News. So part of obviously what Max is talking about is where you get your information and how we get informed to make some decisions. And I think that... Uh, Mr. Ordiz will have some really interesting things on his view about the future of the news. So thank you all for coming. Thank you. Yeah, and thank you so much. And, and good night. <laughs> That's it. Yeah. Okay.